Relativistic velocity, momentum, and energy are going to be the topics of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now we saw one of the postulates for special relativity was that the speed of light in a vacuum has the same value in all inertial frames. Well, it turns out part of the fallout here is that any object with a definite mass cannot have a relative velocity faster than the speed of light. And we're gonna see that we're gonna to have to alter our definition of relative velocity, as well as then momentum and energy, which are dependent upon it as well. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So before we take a look at relative velocity from our new relativistic perspective, let's remind ourselves of what it looked like from our classical Galilean perspective. And so in this case, we're gonna have a spacecraft traveling towards the Earth with a velocity V equals 50 meters per second. It's gonna fire a projectile, so with a velocity U prime of 70 meters per second relative to the spacecraft. And the question is, what's gonna be the velocity of the projectile relative to the Earth? So it's a fairly straightforward calculation here. And so U, I'm gonna define as the, that relative velocity of the projectile relative to the Earth. And it's simply gonna equal U prime, the relative velocity of the projectile to the spacecraft, plus V, the relative velocity of the spacecraft to the Earth. In this case, that's gonna get us 70 meters per second plus 50 meters per second, which is gonna come out to 120 meters per second. So fairly straightforward calculation for relative velocity from our Galilean perspective. Now, as long as our velocities here are fairly small compared to the speed of light, this still works really well. But once the velocities start approaching some significant fraction of the speed of light, so this becomes less and less accurate. And we've got to now use our new relativistic formula for relative velocity. But notice, for something like 70 meters per second and 50 meters per second, well, here you plug these in and you'd have 70 times 50, which would be 3,500. But 3,500 divided by the speed of light squared, that's 300 million meters per second squared, uh, is effectively zero. And one plus zero is still one, and that term goes away, and you're just left with the sum of those uh, relative velocities just like we performed it right here. It's no big deal. But again, let's uh, say these velocities are a little faster now. Instead of 50 meters per second, we're gonna make this 0 0.50 times the speed of light. And instead of this one being 70 meters per second, we're gonna make that 0 0.70 times the speed of light. And the question on our handout here says a spacecraft is traveling towards the Earth with a relative speed of 0.50 c, i.e. times the speed of light, when it fires a projectile weapon with a speed of 0.70 c relative to the spacecraft, what is the speed of the projectile as observed by an observer on Earth? All right, so our new formula here is this one, and so we're gonna have to make this just a little more complicated of a calculation. But again, the key is, if we just added these together, the relative velocity relative to the Earth would come out to faster than the speed of light, 1.2 times the speed of light. So, and again, nothing with definite mass can move faster than the speed of light. And so if we plug this into our new formula here, so now we've got U prime uh, as 0.70 C, we're gonna add that to V, 0.50 C, and then divide by one plus 0.70 C, times 0 0.50 c all over c squared. And so in this case, this c and this c are gonna calculate that c, or cancel out that c squared, and we can plug this into our calculator here. And so in this case, I'm gonna have 0 0.7 plus 0 0.5, I'll just factor in its times the speed of light at the end here. So divided by parentheses, one plus 0.7 times 0.5, and my parentheses. And we're gonna get to two sig figs here, 0.89 times the speed of light. And so U, the speed of the projectile relative to the Earth, again, is not 1.2 C, i.e. faster than the speed of light. It's just 0.89 C instead. And again, is not faster than the speed of light. But the faster this combination of speeds gets, 
the closer this relative speed to whatever your other inertial frame is gets to the speed of light. So now we're going to take a look at momentum and energy from a relativistic perspective. Now we've looked at momentum from a classical perspective in the past, and it was just simply momentum is equal to the product of mass times velocity. And our relativistic definition here, where it's the Lorentz factor times mass times velocity, will reduce down to this classical definition for very low speeds, speeds that are much lower than the speed of light. If you notice if v is much smaller than c, then v squared over c squared is going to be a very tiny fraction, effectively rounding to zero. And one minus zero would be one, and the square root of one is still one, and mv divided by one is just mv. And so that works. But it turns out for fast moving particles, you know, if we just use the, the classical definition of momentum, we might actually come to the conclusion that like momentum is not conserved during collisions of these fast moving particles. But if we use our relativistic definition for momentum, we'll come once again to the conclusion that momentum will be conserved. All right, one thing to note about this definition for momentum, this is specifically the definition of momentum for particles that have an actual rest mass, which means it is not the definition of momentum for photons. Turns out that photons of light also have momentum. It's beyond the scope of this chapter, and we're not gonna study it, but I just want you to realize that this lovely formula here is specifically the momentum of particles having mass, not photons. All right, we've also got a similar equation for energy, and this is gonna look a little bit familiar. You're probably familiar somewhat with more the rest energy of a particle, which is E equals mc squared, and oftentimes Einstein's famous equation is reduced down to this, just this guy here. But it turns out it was a little more than that, as we'll see. So, but in this case, total energy of a particle turns out as gamma, the Lorentz factor, times mc squared. But that energy has two components, kinetic energy and this rest energy that we see right here. And so if this is the total energy and this is the rest energy, then the difference between these two, the total minus the rest, gets you the kinetic energy. Now it turns out this rest energy falls out of this last equation right here, where you take the total energy squared and there's really two parts right here. And you kind of look at this from two different perspectives. So one, what if a particle's not moving? Well, if it's not moving, then it has no momentum and this term goes away. And if you take the square root of both sides, you'd end up with E equals MC squared, which is the rest energy. So that makes sense. That's where that comes from. The other perspective though is what if you were trying to find the total energy of a photon of light? Well, if you have a photon of light, the photon of light doesn't have a rest mass, and it's this term that goes away. Now they do have, again, a momentum P, but it's not given by this equation here, and again, it's beyond the scope of this chapter. But you'd end up with just E equals momentum times the speed of light once you took the square root of both sides for that photon in that case. All right, from here, we're just gonna simply do a, just a teeny bit of plugging and chugging. All right, the only question we're really gonna do here says what is the rest energy of an electron in joules and in electron volts? And the mass of the electron is given. So in this case, the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. We're also told that one electron volt is equal to 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. All right, from here it's gonna be plug and chug, and so we want the rest energy here so of that electron. Well, again, here's our formula for rest energy. That's the classic formula. It's probably the most likely one you're gonna do a calculation with here. And so E equals mc squared. So you gotta to remember to get SI units here. So mass has gotta be in kilograms. So 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms times the speed of light squared, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Do not forget to square that. That's the most common mistake here. We'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting. So 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times 3e to the eighth squared. It's going to get us 8.199. I'll round that to 8.2 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. Now that's the answer in joules. Now it turns out in dealing with you know, subatomic particles like the electron, it's more common instead of dealing with really tiny amounts of joules to deal with what we call electron volts. And it turns out an electron volt is just the uh, energy associated with an electron being accelerated through a one volt potential. And so if you might recall that uh, 1.60 times 10 minus 19 is the charge in coulombs on an electron. And essentially you're multiplying that by a one volt potential. You're accelerating it through 
to then get this sort of potential energy associated with it. So that's where that comes from. And so we can use that here. We'll just do a conversion here. We'll put joules on the bottom, electron volts on top, and one electron volt. Again, it's 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And so if we take our last answer here, this 8.2 times 10 to the negative 14 and divide by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, we'll find out we've got uh, 512,437.5, which rounded to two sig figs here, is going to be 5.1 times 10 to the fifth electron volts. And that's all we're going to do here. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.